Oh man, look at all those wires. Now that's a fat daddy right there. We're at my house. The electricians are about 90% done with the electrical rough in. And in the build show today, I've got five tips for you. We're going to get into the nerdy details, wire gauge, how you should tell your electrician to bid it, what boxes I'm using, what recess cans, and even a little bit of my smart lighting controls. Today's build show is sponsored by Halo Home. Let's get going. Okay guys, tip number one, the wire and the gauge. This is my Romex that I used in my house and I used all 12 to copper. Now this is what that looks like. And this is a slightly thicker gauge than what's often used on production homes or even some custom homes. Often they're wired in 14 to. Now when you wire a house in that thinner gauge copper, that means that your circuit breakers are all gonna be 15 amp, whereas all of mine are 20 amp. Now this is a big deal. I'd highly recommend you tell your electrician to wire it in 12.2, but this is gonna be slightly more expensive. Copper is a commodity, it varies a lot in cost and the wire costs change significantly. In today's dollars, it's about 75 bucks for a bundle of 12.2 wire, whereas the thinner gauge, the 14.2, is about 40 some dollars. So we're talking about a $30 difference per roll, and I used about 20 rolls on this house, so that's you know maybe $600 more to wire this house. But here's the benefit, all my circuit breakers, and by the way, the circuit breakers between a 15 and a 20, basically the same cost, hardly any difference. My 20 amp circuits are gonna pop way less than if I had all 15 amp circuits. I've heard a lot from electricians that get callbacks because a kid in their bedroom has their TV, their computer, their hair dryer, all these devices on a 15 amp circuit and it breaks. Whereas if you have 20 amp circuits with that thicker gauge wire, it's gonna have much less chance of having issues. And remember, this is a static system. This is gonna be in the house for the next 150 years working flawlessly. So a few hundred bucks more on wire, absolutely worth it. I'm gonna rip these walls out and uh, of course rewire it. Hey Matt, what are you wiring that with? 220? Uh, you know, 220, 221, whatever it takes. Well, you sound like a pretty handy guy. Yeah, well. Actually, these are my 220 wires. Let me orient you to where we are. We're in my pantry. This is an exterior wall, and outside here is my main panel box and my meter can. And these 220 wires right here are running my oven, my cooktop, my HVAC systems, that sort of thing. But tip number two is right here. See this big, fat, black wire? This is number two gauge copper, and this is to my sub panel. So my main panel's outside with my 220 circuits, but my 110 circuits are inside, and this big fat black wire is feeding that. Now, the reason why I want to specify copper here and not aluminum, which is totally acceptable, is that copper, number one, is not gonna have any oxidation issues. If we're using aluminum, we need to make sure that it's not gonna oxidize, so we're gonna use some of that clear goo that helps the oxidation process stop on aluminum. The other thing is aluminum, because it's subject to more uh, expansion and contraction, it can actually loosen a little bit here in the future, and we don't want that. The nice thing about copper is once you tighten it down, it's gonna stay tight, and we don't have those oxidation issues. Now again, this is something you wanna tell your electrician when they're bidding the project though. This one piece of wire is probably $100. The electrician can actually buy it by the foot at the supply house, and this is maybe uh, eight to ten dollars per foot, something like that in today's dollars. If I ran it in aluminum, it would be half the cost or maybe a little bit less, three to four dollars a foot. So this is at least 50, 60, 70 dollars more doing it in copper, but the benefit of no oxidation issues and once I tighten it, it's going to stay tight, totally worth it. Okay, tip number three is related to electrical, but is actually an air tightness detail. Everywhere my wires go from the inside to the outside, I wanna drill one hole and put one wire through that. The reason being is, for instance, over here where my main panel is and all these wires coming in from there, most of the time in most houses, even ones I've done in the past, we're gonna drill a big three or four inch hole and we're gonna stuff a bunch of wires through there. The hard part about that is once we get 20 wires through this hole, there's really no good way to air seal that. No matter how much spray foam or caulk you use, there's still gonna be air into there. And if we get air into that space and there's sheetrock back here, what's gonna happen is eventually that sheetrock's gonna have some condensation and some mold develop over time. That also can be an entry point to bugs. 
So this is the first house I'm doing it a little bit differently where I did a mock-up on the outside with my electricians and Rick put a big square box on that's gonna accept all these holes and then we'll feed them up into the main panel box above. That allowed me to drill an individual hole for each one of these wires. And then I can use a little bit of spray foam here just to kind of seal the hole. But on the outside, I can use some liquid flash or some Prosco fast flash and I can really air seal that really, really well on the outside. No airflow through there, no bugs. Now let's go to another area of the house that's really common to see this problem. Okay, so this is my pantry and then this is my laundry room space. And this doorway here separates my house from my garage space. And speaking of air sealing, this is a, a critical space that I see done wrong often on new builds and remodels. This wall that separates the house from the garage, you can see stops right here where my floor joists are. And I've got some second floor joists and my kids' bedrooms above me. What I've done was I had my framer block that area with some OSB in between my floor joists. If I hadn't done that, the electrician, the plumber would be running wires and pipes through that space. It would be super hard to air seal that later. So by putting that blocking, that piece of OSB in there now, I can then have the plumber and the electrician drill that. And again, one hole per one wire. Like over here, we've got a bunch of wires coming through. You can see I've got each one of those in its individual hole. So now I can come back and air seal that. Now I could use some closed cell spray foam. That's a great uh, way to air seal that. I could use one of those little uh, spray foam two tank kits. I could also use some Prosco Fast Flash or potentially some Sega tape on that. But whatever method you do, you really wanna have that plywood in before the electricians show up. All right, that's it for air sealing. Next up, let's talk about some of the really cool smart home products I'm using. Let me meet you at the kitchen island. Okay, tip four, let's actually talk about some of the fixtures and switches I'm gonna be using. This is where I'm gonna talk about the Halo ecosystem. Now, the way I got connected to these guys was I saw this fixture at the International Builder Show earlier this year, and I was totally blown away by it. But the thing about smart home that really gets me going or gets me excited is not smart light bulbs or being able to control a bulb in the house. It's this right here. This is a keypad, a multi-room, multi-scene, lots of functionality keypad. But this button right here is what really does it for me. This is the all off button. So right by my front door, I'm gonna have a keypad like this that when I leave, and I think you probably know I have four young kids in the house, two teenagers and two about to be teenagers, I can hit that button and basically shut down the whole house. That is a really big deal for me. When we talk about smart home though, let's talk about how their ecosystem works. Pretty much all of these products, except for one, are all Bluetooth enabled. And they've got a fantastic app for your phone that you're gonna bring each one of these devices in that app so that you can control that device. We can control things like color temperature and we can vary from uh, really uh, warm or really cool like daylight temperatures. We can also control the dimming and they have kind of two different things that we can do. We can either control that at the switch, which is what this keypad is, or these switches, or we can control it actually at the fixture. Now they're Bluetooth, which means that they're communicating direct to your phone. It's not using your Wi-Fi network. We don't need the cable guy to hook up the, the network to set this up. We can all do it from our phone. And they're mesh enabled, meaning they talk to each other. So these devices are gonna ping ponging the signal so that from here, even though my security lights, let's say, are, that are also gonna be controlled might be 75 feet away on the other side of the house, these devices are gonna to talk to each other and I'm gonna be able to be in the kitchen and control this one even though we're using Bluetooth. And let's talk about the individual devices. I mentioned this one being the one that blew me away at the International Builder Show. This is a really, really thin LED. It's a four inch model. This is actually their, let me get the model name. This is their HLB4. This is about 700 lumens, 697. But let me show you the feature on this that I think is fantastic. I'll meet you on the ladder. Okay, so this is that micro fixture that I was showing you about. It's a half inch thick. And here's its superpower right here. They actually call this a canless fixture, meaning you don't have the typical recessed can. All you're gonna do is put this plate up here and then this is gonna allow the sheetrock guys to cut out the sheetrock 
and the electrician is going to direct wire it. This box right here is going to get that Romex wired right into. But what's cool about these is because they're so wafer thin, they're like a half inch thick, I actually don't have to use this mounting plate if I don't want to. And in fact, over here is my wood ceiling mock-up. I've got uh, sheetrock over here, but then I've got a three quarter wood ceiling going over top of that. And what I'm gonna do is when my finished carpenter is running that wood ceiling across, I'm actually gonna take this mounting plate off and then the carpenter can mount this wherever it needs to go in the ceiling. We can move it so it's really centered in that six inch board and is gonna look perfect in the location. And then check it out. Even if it was located in regular sheetrock, even half inch sheetrock at a joist, it's thin enough, you could center it on the joist. So you're no longer worried about slamming your can over against the wall to try and get something that, oh, it's six inches off center. No, we could actually mount this if we wanted to right on the joist. We'll direct wire it, connect this, and then this will get pushed into the hole. The electrician wires it up. And then these clips right here are actually gonna hold it onto the sheetrock, the can, or the wood ceiling, whatever you want. That is a really cool fixture. And while we're in the foyer here, let me show you something else. I mentioned that light switch, that multi-room keypad kind of being the real game changer for me. I wired the house a little bit differently to accommodate this. If you look when you come in here, I've got this single keypad right here. And you see I've got a bunch of S's right here. Had I used a regular light switch bank, I would have had one, two, three, four switches in this location. But instead, I've wired just one location. This is hardwired, meaning power is going to it. There's no battery to replace. And then when I walk in at my front door right here, boom, I'll press this number one button. And whatever scene I set up, whatever grouping of individual lights, all those will turn on. I could also program button three or four to be party mode or I'm leaving the house mode. And again, I've also got the all off button. I really like that. I'm leaving the house. I'm wondering if kids' closets or bathrooms or bedrooms are on. I hit the all off button and everything shuts down in the house. Now, what I've done though, is I've wired that a little bit differently. I had Rick and his guys wire this so that those switches, we still have an actual switch location with Romex going to it. Those are in my foyer closet. This is where my coat, coats will be in the foyer area. And all those switches will be located over there. Those will be Halo smart switches. And with those smart switches, they can either run some standard old school cans that are not smart lights, or they could run Halo smart lights. It doesn't matter. Let's go back to the desktop and I'll show you a couple more of those fixtures. Okay, let me show you a few more of these fixtures. And then I'm actually going to get in, into my reflected ceiling plan and kind of show you my strategy of where to use them. So first off, secondary spaces, garages, closets, that sort of thing. This is a fairly thin fixture, but it just has a standard uh, box in the ceiling, nothing fancy. 800 lumen output of that, and they make that in two sizes. Next up in my kitchen, I did use a little bit more of an expensive light in my kitchen. This is uh, a light that is gonna end up having a two inch aperture. So a really small little trim right there, which is actually two inches, but a lot of really high quality light. Now this is a slightly more expensive fixture. This module right here is like 60, 65 bucks and I still need to buy a $20 trim for this. And this has a pretty normal looking housing like we've used for years. So all in, we might be somewhere in the 80 to 100 bucks for each one of these between trim, can, module, all that sort of thing. And then lastly, they have two different models of floodlights on the outside. This model has the um, motion control. They also have this without the motion control. This is about a $100 fixture, so this is probably the most expensive thing on the table, but we've got a nice solid aluminum housing. When this senses motion on the outside, I can set the app to say, hey, turn on the side light houses, the side lights as well in the house, or even turn on the kitchen lights so that it's someone who was uh, prowling in my yard would think that I'm home because multiple things are coming on, not just this motion uh, sensing floodlight. The other thing I can do is I can set up individual lights or switches on the app, up to 200 of them, by the way, and then I can group those together into specific areas of the house. And with that, let me transition to the plan and show you that real quick. So this is my reflected ceiling plan. My architect and I 
went through and decided together on this. And I color coded this so that my electrician would know exactly what goes where. So here, here's the different halo uh, fixtures that I used on the house. And here's where it is. If you wanna pause the video here, you can get a full view of this and you can come back and refer to this later if you're interested in helping this design your house. But briefly, I did a bunch of these rather inexpensive ceiling mounts in my garage so that everywhere in my garage, I've got some really good light. In the kitchen, I use the most expensive light. That's this one right here. And then as we transition to the foyer and the dining room space where I've got the wood ceiling and I really wanted to make sure these were put in the exact spot, I went with the, the tiny fixture. That way this guy, uh, this micro edge can be placed exactly where I want it in the boards. In the living room, I've got a slope ceiling. So I used a slightly different can. This is one that will adjust to the slope ceiling area. And then in the bedroom, I've got a couple cool things going on um, that I'll, I'm actually gonna show you that in one second. But let's also briefly touch on the second floor. In the second floor, I used a variety of, of different fixtures from Halo in there, uh, from some surface mounts inside all my secondary spaces like closets to um, these four inch cans just about everywhere else. I really like their system. These guys have really thought about it. And as I mentioned earlier, pricing wise, everything on the table here is really well priced. This is definitely a common man's smart home system. I've used the big L on a lot of jobs and they make some fantastic systems for lighting control, but man, they can get expensive. So for the functionality that we've got here, this is a really nice system. All right guys, so this is my front door in the house and we're on the front porch now. Tip five, I'm gonna to talk to you about some specific boxes that I use in the house that I think are really interesting. And I'm also gonna walk a few places of the house and show you just a few general tips of what I did electrically. So uh, first off, generally speaking, I really like soffit cans. On my current house, I added these later and man, they are really nice. I just have a couple cans here in this soffit and then I've got two more in front of my garage bay. I like the light from those a lot better than sconces. I feel like they really light up the area and they're not directly in your eyes. Then I also ran some standard cans on the porch to light up this porch area. And then my guys made these boxes right here, um, which are gonna accept my siding. And then eventually I will have a sconce on either side of the front door. But I made a mock-up to try and figure out the details earlier. And let's look at that. This is a vertical box. And this happens to be a product from Arlington. They call this the Inbox from Arlington. And they make it in a bunch of different flavors and varieties. This is one that's intended for stucco, but this one right here is for siding. And if you look at this mock-up on the side, this box could actually recess into the wall and you can spray foam that or do some other air sealing. But because I was going for extreme air sealing, what I wanted to do was have that box outside of my zip sheathing, which is really my water and my air barrier in the house. And then after that wire comes through, you can see here, we've added some Prosco fast flash. It looks like a caulking, but in fact, that's, that's a liquid applied uh, waterproofing agent that also does a great job of air sealing. And now those two wires will eventually have this box put on. And this is an in-use cover box. You can get it in um, this kind of clear color. I'm actually gonna do white on most of the house so you won't see into it. But they've got a, a little spot here so you could actually have something plugged in. The cord would come out and you can shut it. And that's why they call it a recess box because when that cover's closed, you could still have something plugged in and it doesn't stick out like those really ugly bubble covers. All right, uh, let's transition from here to the master bedroom. And I've got a couple cool things in there I wanna show you. Okay, master bedroom. On the same theme of tip five for specialty boxes, another specialty box from Arlington that they make is this one. And this is an airtight box. And this is great to use on exterior walls because air that might get past your exterior air barrier is gonna get stopped at that box. Now, I'm actually not doing it for that. All of my heavy lifting for air barrier for me is on the face of the zip. But you'll also notice I use these between the master and the closet. And I'm using this on some of my interior walls for, for sound reasons. I'm trying to reduce that sound transmission between rooms. Now, it's not as big a deal to reduce from my master closet to my master. This is actually my bed wall right here. 
but I wanted to do these in a couple places. Now, full disclosure, uh, uh, Arlington did not sponsor the video, but they did give me some free products. So I wanted to try these out of my house. I'm curious how much of a difference that makes, but I think for sure using these on the outside on a kind of standard construction house would definitely make a difference. So I'd highly recommend those boxes there. One other tip you'll notice here though, I mentioned this is my master bed wall. My vanities will be, on, or my, uh, pardon me, my nightstands rather will be on either side. I really like putting double outlets on either side there. That way your iPhone charger, your clock, whatever else you plug in, you don't have to worry about putting a power strip there. Having that double outlet, so much better. And then as we go into my master, I wanna mention a couple things that I wired that are a little bit unusual. I'm doing a heated floor system from Schluter in my master, and that's what this conduit is. This is a little bit atypical, but I'm really excited about having a warm floor. So what we do is the electrician is wiring that, and this is a 220 hookup. So I've got a 220 wire here, and then these two cables are blank right now. When my tile guy comes, that's when we'll actually feed the wires from that Schluter heated floor mat into here, so we're all set up for that in the future. Okay, next thing I wanted to mention that's a little bit different electrically is I've got a wire here that will eventually get hooked up into my Roburn recessed medicine cabinets. I like the fact that I could have a plug. They have an option to put a plug inside their medicine cabinet. So now my electric toothbrush can be plugged in and ready to go and not be sitting on the counter. Stay tuned for a future video on that because I actually have some sconces that are built in to those medicine cabinets that are gonna give me really nice light on my face. And then lastly, let's transition to the closet for my last bit of luxury that I added on my house that's getting wired up. This is a Mr. Steam towel warmer. And man, I'm excited about this. What this is is an oil filled rack. It's kind of heavy, it probably weighs 40 or 50 pounds. And this is gonna heat my towels and dry them quicker and allow me when I jump out of the shower, which is right there, to grab a warm towel. Now this is a direct wire fixture and I also needed to put some blocking in. I've marked it, but I haven't put it in yet. I need a couple of two by sixes or a two by 12 there so I can direct mount this on. And then Rick, the electrician, when he sets this out at the final, we'll have this wire direct wired into this unit. I'm really excited about that. Guys, that's it. Hopefully you learned something today about new construction electrical, both on a few of the products that I used and also how to bid this with your electrician. Big thanks to my friends at Halo Home. They really won me over at their booth at IBS and I'm excited about using some of their products. But I'm also really excited to share with you because I feel like their system is really reasonably priced. It's available at all the home centers, uh, these devices that I'm talking about using here, they're only maybe 20, 25% more than kind of standard dumb devices with a lot of functionality. And I also like that there's no weirdo low voltage or uh, you know wireless or battery operated. Everything gets wired with normal wires so that someday if I wanna change those out, it's gonna be really easy to do that. Guys, if you're not currently a subscriber, hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content here in the Build Show every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow me on Twitter or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show.